What is the axiom of existence? The axiom of existence simply is the statement that the world that we experience, we see it, we taste it, we touch it, is a reality external to us and it exists independent of us. But then secondly, there must also be the acknowledgement that all the evidence is very clear that the universe, or reality as we perceive it, is not eternal. Again, there were two options. Either the universe, which exists, is eternal and self-perpetuating, or the universe had a beginning and will have an end. Well, the evidence against the idea of an eternal universe is so complete that no modern uh, scientist or philosopher will even countenance uh, the absurdity of an eternal universe. The reason that the universe is clearly not eternal is simply that the universe is winding down like a clock. Given the second law of thermodynamics, which says that more energy is given off during an exchange or activity than what is put into the new product, and this energy which is given off, which can never be reclaimed, is called entropy, the universe is losing energy. It's winding down. You can just take the planet Earth itself. We are now faced with an energy crisis. If the world was eternal, then the world would be continually producing oil and coal in such quantities as it, such that it would never run out. But given the reality that there is only so many sources of organic energy on this planet, once we have used them up, that's it. The sun that now shines beautifully during the day will one day nova and no longer be. There are quasars, there are stars that have gone out with the bang. There are black holes of stars that have collapsed inwardly. And you see, as you look around the universe and you see the rust, you see the degeneration, you see the collapse, you see the disintegration, you have to admit the scientific fact that we are not living in a universe which is eternal. The universe is blowing up like a balloon. And if you simply turn the process back, you discover that the universe had a beginning. It is not eternal. Well then, thirdly, we must ask the question, since the universe which exists is not eternal and had a beginning and will probably have an end one day, what is the, what is the probability that this universe could have popped out of nothing and could have evolved to the complex state that it exists today with all the interpersonal relationships required, what is the mathematical probability that what is today is the result simply of mindless chance and evolution? Well, this question was put to the famous computers at MIT the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which probably has uh, the greatest computer system uh, in the United States today. The computer was simply asked this question. Given from three to five, nine billion years, plus chance, plus matter, what is the probability that the universe in all of its complex complexity as it exists today could have gotten this way simply on the basis of time, chance, and matter. The computer responded that it is zero probability. It is simply an impossibility that the complex universe that now exists could have simply popped out of nothing. Or again, other mathematicians such as Polanyi have pointed out the absurdity of thinking that the universe has come to the state it is today out of nothing 
and with no creator or guide. He mentions this illustration in his book dealing with statistics. Imagine that you were on a train and you were riding into Wales. You looked out your window and you saw on a hillside a sign that said, Welcome to Wales. Now the sign was made up of white stones, boulders, that were rolled together to form the words, Welcome to Wales, and then these stones were painted white so that from far off you could see on this mountainside welcome to Wales made up of white stones. Well, he decided to figure out the probability. What is the probability of these stones popping out of the earth by themselves and rolling by chance to make the configuration welcome to Wales and also by chance by some way that these stones would all be white so that the welcome to Wales sign is the total product of time plus chance plus matter. Well, the end result, of course, is obvious. Only a fool would believe that that sign, welcome to Wales, could have been produced simply by erosion or by the forces of chance. Given any amount of time desired, you would never be able to come up with welcome to Wales by chance. Hence, says Polanyi, the theory of evolution, the idea that this universe has got to where it is today by simply time plus chance plus matter is mathematically absurd. Or again, as some modern philosophers have pointed out, imagine you were walking through a jungle. Now, I mean a real jungle where there's a lot of undergrowth, huge trees, there's swamps, there's disorganization, there's decaying vegetation. You're talking about a piece of real estate that has never been developed. It's in the raw, raw nature. Well, all of a sudden, you come upon a clearing in the middle of this jungle. And in the middle of this clearing, there's a garden. And there's a row of cabbages. Then there's a row of carrots. Then there's a row of onions. And over there, there's some bean bushes. And you look and see banana trees. And you see breadfruit. You see a garden. And it is arranged and it is orderly. And it is there. Now you sit down and you look at this garden. And all sorts of questions come to your mind. Number one, could this garden and all of its complexity simply be the results of chance? Maybe a bird was flying over and dropped the seeds for the cabbage, but then that doesn't explain the carrots. Well, is there any chance that this whole garden was produced simply by the blind forces of nature? And you look at it and you know that there is no way that this can be. Secondly, do you see any gardener? The answer is no. You don't see a gardener, but you do see the garden. From the complexity and the order, you can arrive at the fact that there is a gardener who comes into that clearing and who weeds it and takes care of the garden, and these things were planted for a purpose, and they will be utilized unto that goal. Only a jackass, only a fool would believe that this garden was the result of blind chance. For you see, chance destroys whatever chance creates. It's like those who say life began in some sea pool and the wave came together and somehow or the other an amino acid chain was formed. But in the next breath, you can remind them, and the next wave came and unraveled the chain. Or the proverbial monkey who is typing at a typewriter for millions and billions of years, finally he says, to be or not to be, that is the kasagubuzagubuzagub. What chance creates, chance destroys. The universe as it exists today has within it form, C 
symmetry, order, rhythm, harmony. There is beauty in the world. There are different colors. Why does a black cow eat green grass and give white milk? There is a veritable cosmic garden before our eyes. This is why Albert Einstein, looking at the mathematical precision of reality, stated that there must be a God. Given the universe as it is, there has to be a God, said Albert Einstein, as reported by Lincoln Barnett in his book, The Universe and Dr. Einstein. You see, if the earth were 5% closer to the sun, we would all be burned up. If the earth were 5% further away from the sun, we'd all freeze to death. The earth is in the exact location that it would have to be in order to support biological life on this planet. Given the personality of man, given the harmony, the unity, the order, the symmetry, look at the wasp who must sting the tarantula in order to lay its eggs on the tarantula's body. Which came first, the tarantula or the wasp? Look at the bee who goes to pollinate the flowers and thus, because of his gathering the pollen and the nectar, he ends up fertilizing the flowers. Which came first, the bee or the flower? Given the universe as it is, the only logical conclusion you could come to is that there is a great gardener. There is a mathematical mind. There is a God to whom you will be held accountable one day. And this God loved you so much that he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for the likes of you. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? He who is God incarnate, do you love him? Do you trust him? He is the final answer to the riddle of agnosticism. In this session, we want to answer the question, who is God? What is God? First of all, in our discussion, we are assuming, of course, that there really is a God that truly exists independent of man or the universe. We are not discussing a God that is created in man's own image, a God that is simply the fruit of an overactive imagination, or simply the end result of wish fulfillment or some psychological need within man. We are, of course, aware of those who try to tell us that the only God that exists is the God that people project in their minds, a God that will satisfy some psychological need that these people have. But we're not talking about these man-made gods. We're talking about the true and living God, He who exists, has always existed, from all eternity. This is why when Moses asked God for his personal name in Exodus chapter 2, God told Moses in verse 14, Tell them that I am has sent you to them. I am that I am. In other words, God is a self-existent cogn cognitive ego just as much as you and I are cognitive egos. You and I are conversing together by way of this radio station. You are responding and listening to my voice, and I am speaking. If you were here in the studio, we could talk face to face, person to person. And this is exactly how Moses was talking with God. God was a self-existent cognitive ego. He could say, I am that I am. Thus, we are not talking about a projection of man's hopes or fears, but we are asking the question, since there is, evidently and logically speaking, a God who is really there, we should ask, what is he like? Who is he? What are his thoughts, his feelings? What is his nature? What is his being? And how can I get right with him? The first definition for God that is given in the scriptures 
is found on the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 4 and verse 24. There the Lord Jesus Christ said, and quite emphatically, that God is spirit, and they who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth, for they are the kinds of people that the Father is seeking to worship him. Here the Lord Jesus Christ points out that God, here speaking of the Father, in terms of his own essence or being, is spirit. He goes on in Luke chapter 24 and verse 39 to divine, define spirit as that which is non-material. He states in this verse, a spirit does not have a body, as you see that I have. Thus God is spirit, that is God is non-material. Further, the Apostle Paul tells us in Colossians 1 and verse 15 that God is invisible. Since in his essence or being God is spiritual and of a non-material nature or existence, God is of course invisible that is, he is not something that can be seen with the human eye or simply heard with the human ear. As a matter of fact, all of these verses point to the great truth that God should never be confused with an idol or material object in this world. Thus we are told in the second commandment of the Ten Commandments in Exodus that we should not make any graven images of God whatsoever. We're not to make any graven images of any things that supposedly exist in heaven or any creature that exists on earth or indeed any creature that exists in the sea or that burrows under the ground in the earth. Here the Israelis were told that idolatry was nauseous to God. Idolatry was something which made God very unhappy. Matter of fact, it made him angry. Angry enough to visit his wrath upon idolaters to the third and fourth generation of those that hate him. In Psalm 115, verses 1 through 8, we read one of the classic argumentum ad ridiculums, that is, arguments of ridicule given in Scripture against those who confuse God with some inanimate object and worship idols. In Psalm 115, listen to the words of the psalmist. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens, and he has done whatever he hath pleased. But their idols are silver and gold the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not, eyes, but they see not, they have ears, but they hear not, they have noses, but they smell not, they have hands, but they handle not, they have feet, but they walk not, neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them, so is every one that trusts in them. Here the psalmist simply points out the foolishness of idolatry. The thought that you and I could take a piece of wood and whittle it and overlay it with gold and silver and then bow down to it, worship it, kiss it, adore it, pray to it is absolutely absurd. Is not he who made the idol greater than that which he made? Is not the idol simply a piece of wood or of stone or of precious metal? This is why in Romans chapter 1 verses 22 through 23 the Apostle Paul tells us that idolatry arose as a result of man's rejection of the revelation of God. We are told in Romans 1 that God has revealed himself to all of humanity by the orderliness and harmony which exists in the creation order itself. In other words, they have the light of creation. Then in Romans chapter 2, he reminds them that they also have the light 
of conscience in verses 14 and 15. Thus, externally and internally, there is no excuse for idolatry whatsoever. Thus, in verse 20 in chapter 1, we read this, The invisible things of God are from the creation of the world clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. He goes on to state in verses 22 and 23, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an idol made like unto a corruptible man or to birds or foot, four-footed beasts and creeping things. Here in Romans 1, the Apostle Paul states that idolatry arose as man rejected the light that God had given to him from the creation without and the conscience within. Idolatry is not only foolishness, it is also wickedness. It is rebellion against God. In the Jewish traditions, we are told the story of how Abraham cured his father of idol worship. After God had revealed himself to Abraham, and Abraham no longer would worship the family idols that were kept on a shelf in a special idol room, Abraham thought and prayed, how can I have my father understand that the idols are nothing but pieces of wood or stone, and that there is but one true and living God, who is spirit, who is non-material, who is invisible, and there should be no idols to represent the true God. Well, he had a brilliant idea one night, so in the middle of the night, he went in to the idol room. He picked up a club and smashed one of the idols and then put the club down at the feet of the next idol to it. In the morning, when Abraham's father went in to do his obeisance to the idols, he discovered that one of them had been smashed. With a roar, he yelled, Who is it that has destroyed my idol? Who broke this idol? Who harmed this god? And Abraham looked at him and simply pointed over to the club that was at the feet of the other idol. Hmm said Abraham's father. He didn't say anything. Well, the next night, Abraham broke all of the idols except one and left the club at the foot of that idol. In the morning, when, it, when Abraham's father discovered how all the idols had been smashed except one, he became absolutely angry. He was furious, and he had a good idea that it had to be Abraham. And he called Abraham in and said, All right. You have to be the one that has smashed all of these gods. But Abraham looked at him and said, But father, the club is at the feet of that one who is left. Perhaps he was jealous and in his rage he destroyed the others. His father yelled at him, That's impossible. It's only a piece of stone. It's only a piece of wood. And with those words, the light dawned on Abraham that they were not gods at all. And with one blow of the club, he smashed the last idol. And this is how Abraham taught his father not to worship idols anymore. This is an important word for those of you who are our Hindu friends. You've come from India to live here in the New World to set up shops, and we appreciate your thriftiness, your cleanliness, your delicious cuisine, but you see, we are bothered by your idolatry. The thought that you are bowing down to an idol of Shiva, or you are bowing down to an idol of Kali, or you are bowing down to an idol of Krishna, or perhaps you are worshipping the monkey god or the elephant god. Isn't this actually foolish, dear Hindu friends? You are worshipping a piece of stone. A piece of stone that you could take a hammer and smash it into a thousand pieces. We would plead with you, dear Hindu friends and our Hare Krishna friends, that you destroy the idols, that you burn them up, throw them out, smash them, and accept the fact that there is but one true eternal God. 
It is said that in India there are up to three billion gods and they have made cows to be God whereas we eat them for hamburgers in this country and they worship some of them insects. As a matter of fact they do everything that Paul described worshiping the images of men, of four-footed animals, of birds, and even insects. Won't you turn from your rebellion to worship the true and living God? We also have a word here to our Roman Catholic friends. When you bow down and kiss the feet of the statue of Jesus, Joseph, or Mary, or perhaps you go and you adore and worship the statue of your favorite saint, you are committing idolatry. You see, God's commandment is very clear when he said in the second commandment that you're not to make any images whatsoever or bow down to them or serve them. Now, I know that you like to claim that they are aids to worship, but in reality, they are nothing more than idols. It is nothing but the grossest kind of superstition and darkness that you should be enslaved to worshiping the idols of those who, if they were alive, would tell you to worship no idols. Jesus would certainly tell you not to worship a statue. So would Joseph and so would Mary. So would St. Jude or St. Peter. They would instruct you that God has said that you are not to worship idols or images. You are not to pray to them. Isn't it foolish when people would put a little statue in the dashboard of their car and think that that statue is going to deliver them? Or they put a medallion around their neck? Or they throw the image of a saint into the sea because it's supposed to help fishermen? All these things are idolatry. And we would plead with you that you would listen to the scriptures and that you would go and that you would destroy these idols. You would burn them up. You would smash them in order that everyone may see that you worship the true and living God. Well, the scriptures not only tell us that God is spirit, but the scriptures also tell us that God is the creator. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, we read, When the beginning began, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, there was God. And then God created the universe out of nothing. This is what the Hebrew word means, the bara. Out of nothing, God created the heavens and the universe. Thus, the universe is not a part of God. The universe is not God. We as Christians cannot hold to any views of pantheism in which God is equated to the universe or pan-everythingism in which supposedly the entire universe is some kind of living organism or just where everything is God and God is everything. We are told throughout the scriptures that God is qualitatively distinct from the world that he has created. I am not God. You are not God. This world is not God or a part of God. It does not flow out of the essence of God. We are not a bit of God that oozed out of God that's oozing back into God. God created the universe distinct from him out of nothing by his own power. But then again, we are told in Scripture that God is personal. This is why the Bible speaks of the Trinity. There is one eternal God, eternally existent, in three centers of personality, which are metaphorically called the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit make up the one true eternal God. They are the one God who is personal. Thus God can say, I am that I am. He can say, let us make man in our image. Let us go down to the Tower of Babel and see what they have done. Throughout the scriptures, God plans. God hears prayer. God acts in the space-time continuum which we call history. God is a personal God. He is a God of love, a God of justice. He thinks, he wills, and he has his purposes and plans. 
Thus, you see, we should not think of God as simply being some kind of impersonal force or energy that exists in the cosmos. Some of you enjoyed the movie Star Wars and The Empire Strikes Back. Well, the view that is given in that movie, that ultimate reality, or God, is simply the force, and the force has a negative and positive side, has a dark and a light, a good and an evil, a yin and a yang, or whatever it is, is actually the view that has been utilized for, by witchcraft for thousands of years. Those who involved in obia and in voodoo, root men, those who are involved in the occult have always stated that God, if there is a God, must not be viewed as a separate personality, but God is simply an impersonal force or energy, something like electricity, that we can tap into and that we can use for our own selfish gains and purposes. Well, you see, God is not an impersonal force. God is personal as well as infinite. And this leads us to our last point. God is infinite. You see, God is not only the personal creator who brought this universe into being, but he is the infinite and the only true and living God that there is. What do we mean when we speak of God being infinite? Well, we mean that he is infinite in power or omnipotent. Omnipotence simply means that God has all the power available to him within his own being to do all those things which his own character and nature will allow him to do. Thus we are told that while God is all-powerful, he cannot lie, he cannot do that which is non-God. Well, we also speak of God being infinite in terms of his presence. God cannot be localized as, let's say, uh, God is down in Argentina as opposed to being uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. God is omnipresent, everywhere at the same time, though not being everything at the same time. God is where you are as well as where I am. God is infinite in knowledge or omniscient. He knows all. There is no ignorance with God. And God is infinite in his sovereignty. His sovereignty rules over all. And you see, this is in opposition to those who believe in finite gods. Do you realize, dear listeners, that the Mormons actually teach that the God of this world was a finite God? Originally, the Mormons taught that Adam was the true God who came to this planet and he brought one of his wives, Eve, and he came here to populate this planet. As an end result, today, every Mormon missionary, all the young men, that is, who perhaps come to your door from the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, each of them hopes and plans on becoming a God, a finite God, and being given his own planet. This is why he joined the priesthood. This is why he'll seek to have his marriage sealed in, the, in a temple. He is striving to become a finite God. Or again, some of you perhaps watch the cultic show put on by the Armstrongs, either Herbert or Ted, the Worldwide Church of God. This is a cultic organization which believes that those who join up with them can become a God. Or you have other groups like the Scientologists who will tell you that you are a God and you simply have forgotten your Godhood. And we could go on and on and on with all the different groups today who tell you that they believe in God but they believe in finite gods. And you and I can become one if we join up with their organization. This then is the biblical teaching on the nature of God. There is but one God eternally existent in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God is spirit and not matter. God is the one who created this universe, the one to whom you are accountable and before whom you will stand in judgment one day. The next question that we should address ourselves to is, who 
is Jesus Christ. While Jesus was upon this earth, we find recorded in Matthew chapter 16 that he asked his disciples, Whom do men say that I am? When they gave him the various popular answers, he's John the Baptist who's been resurrected, perhaps he's some great prophet, etc. Then Jesus said, Whom do you say that I am? In answer, we have Peter's confession of faith, which became the historic foundation of the Christian church. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And of course, Jesus reacted. And he reacted by saying, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter, but my Father who is in heaven. You see, the issue of who Jesus Christ is is perhaps the greatest question that you will ever face in your lifetime. Now, we must beware of the fact that the Apostle Paul tells us that there were people in his day, as well as in our day, who teach another kind of Jesus, another kind of gospel. These are the people who would have us have a different understanding of who Jesus Christ really is. For this reason, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we read, verse 3, I am afraid, lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds should be led astray from the simplicity and purity which is in Christ. For if someone comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit for which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear it beautifully. The same warning is given in the book of Galatians chapter 1. We are told that in those days, particularly referring to the Gnostics, there were those who were preaching another gospel. Verse 8, Even though we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we have preached to you, let him be cursed of God. As we have said before, so I say it now again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you have received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Here the Apostle Paul tells us, as well as in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, that there are other Jesuses, other Gospels, and other spirits. What you have to do is to be sure that you have the right one. If you have the wrong Jesus, you're not going to make it to the, to the heaven to which Jesus had ascended. As it was in Paul's day, so it is today. There are many different cultic groups, and all of them deny the biblical teaching concerning the identity of Jesus Christ. Some people would tell you that Jesus was a Marxist rebel, and he sought to overthrow the Roman government by violent means, and he taught Marxist and Leninist philosophy. Of course, this is a lot of bunk. There are those who tell you that Jesus never claimed to be anything more than a simple Jewish rabbi. And he taught people to love one another and to do good works and to get on with it. Of course, that is a lot of bunk as well. If we want to find out who Jesus is, then we must go to the primary documents concerning him, which are found in the Old and New Testaments. In the Old Testament, of course, it was prophesied that the Messiah would come. And in Isaiah 9 and verse 6, we are told, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government will rest upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Father of Eternity, and the Prince of Peace. Here, in Isaiah's vision of the coming of the Messiah, he said that the Messiah would be known as the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Father of Eternity, or Everlasting Life, and the Prince of Peace. 
it is clearly stated that the Messiah was to be El Gabor, Mighty God. Now the absence of the definite article does not really mean anything at all. For the same phrase, El Gabor, without the definite article, is used elsewhere in Isaiah, particularly in the book of Jeremiah, to refer to Yahweh or Jehovah God himself. It was a term which referred to God as the mighty warrior, as the one who triumphs over his enemies. Thus, right at the beginning, Isaiah would tell us that the babe who was going to be born is more than a man. The child in the cradle is mighty God, the Father of eternity. The same thing can be said for the prophecy in Micah chapter 5. Here, God is telling us where the Messiah is going to be born, but he also tells us from whence the Messiah came. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from very long ago, even from the days of eternity. The Hebrew word olam here means from everlasting. It is the same word used in Psalm 90, in verse 2, that the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, from eternity itself, from timelessness itself. Thus the Messiah comes out of eternity and not as a creature of the space-time continuum, which we simply call history. The Messiah was not to be a creature. He was not simply someone that God created, but the Messiah was, and certainly came to be, God as well as man in human form. Would you please turn with me to the Gospel of John, and this morning we want to do a very quick survey of the material in the New Testament which speaks of Jesus Christ being God as well as man. Now we must emphasize that the orthodox position has always been that Jesus is both. Yes, he was the second Adam. He was man of very man. He cried, he wept, he got tired, he got sore just like you and I. He was a man, tempted in every point like we were, yet without sin. Thus, we could go through the New Testament and prove that Jesus was a man. He went up to a fig tree and he wanted some figs, but there weren't any figs. That's what a man would do. And you see, when Jesus said, the Father is greater than I, he's referring to the fact that as a man, the Father is greater than all of us, who are human beings as well. The point of contention with the cultists, such as the Jehovah's Witnesses and other cultic groups, is that they deny that Jesus is God, the Son, as well as man. But if you turn with me to the Gospel of John, you'll find that John, at the very beginning of his Gospel, points out that the Word, or the Lord Jesus Christ, in terms of his own nature, is deity, or God, as well as man. In John 1.1 1, 1 we read, In the beginning was the word. You should circle the word was because in the Greek this word means that the word was already existing when the universe began. It can be translated this way. When the beginning began, the word already was. You see, the word was not brought into existence when God created the universe, but the word is from eternity. The Word always existed, and when the beginning of the universe began, the Word already was there. He also says that the Word was with God, or as the Greek says, alongside of God. From verse 18, it is clearly speaking of God the Father. The Word was from all eternity. The Word was there when the creation was spoken into being. And the Word was al always alongside of God the Father. And the Word was, as to his own nature, deity or God as well. And the Word was God. 
In the Greek, the word God is put first, and God was the word in order to emphasize that the word was not to be viewed as some creature inferior to God, but that the Father and the Son, and later we see in other passages the Holy Spirit, make up the one true eternal God. Now there are some translations like the Jehovah's Witnesses have put out that says that the word was a God. They do this because they do not know Greek grammar. It is impossible in terms of the Greek grammar of the text to say that the word was a God. The only reason they put that into the New World Translation was because they wanted to escape from the fact that John says that the word, that is Christ, was God. Then we read in verse 14 that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he goes on to speak of the fact that this word was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. The word which existed from all eternity, which was alongside of God the Father, which was deity in and of itself, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld in his face the glory of the Father, even in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Later in verse 18, John puts it another way. He states that no one has ever seen God the Father. This is because God the Father is invisible. God the Father is spirit. He is not a man, says Numbers 23 and verse 19. Well, no one has ever seen God the Father at any time. But the only begotten God, or the Greek says, the unique God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has revealed him. The King James says the only begotten Son, but the word Son is an inaccurate rendering of the original. The better manuscripts read God. It simply says this, while no one has ever seen the Father, they have seen the Son. They cannot see God the Father, but they can see God the Son. And in the face of God the Son, you will learn all that there is to learn about the identity of God. Thus Jesus is called God in verse 1. He is called God by name in verse 18. Then in chapter 5, if you would please turn with me in your Bibles to that text, here in verse 18, the Apostle John tells us that Jesus in his deity is equal with the Father. For this cause, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own Father. Now comes a comma. You ought to circle that comma, because the comma reveals that the next words are John's comments and not the conclusion of the Pharisees. This is a very important grammatical point that needs to be made. When we read the Bible, we should follow the grammar of the English text or of the Greek text, whichever one we're reading. What does John say? Well, he says that when Jesus claimed that God was his unique Father, he was making himself equal with God. This is the doctrine of the Trinity, that Jesus is equal to the Father in terms of his deity, though he is subordinate to the Father in terms of his humanity. Jesus is both at the same time, equal and subordinate. This is why in verse 23 that we are told that we should honor the Son even as we honor the Father. They both receive equal honor. Or again, over in John chapter 8, we have where Jesus claims one of the divine names. We mentioned in our last talk together that God called himself the I am, the self-existent cognitive ego, the I am. In verse 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am, ego, ami. If you look in the Greek version of the Old Testament, Back to the book of Exodus, where God told Moses, tell them that I am has sent you, 
and I am that I am, you will find in the Greek that it says, Ego a me ho own. I am that I am. And the Ego a me became in the Jewish mind a way of speaking of God. Thus when Jesus said, Ego a me, I am, verse 59, the Jews picked up stones to kill him. Now there were only certain sins for which someone could be stoned. The only one applicable in this situation was that they thought he was blaspheming because he was claiming to be God. He was taking the divine name, I am, and applying it to himself. Well again, I hate to say it, but some groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses have ignored the grammar of the Greek tense. As a matter of fact, the Jehovah's Witnesses invented a Greek tense which doesn't really exist at all and try to translate it, I have been, which of course is impossible. Ego Amy can only be translated one way, I am. If you turn over to John chapter 10, we see that the Jews begin to pick up stones to kill him. Verse 31. Jesus said, I've showed you many good works from the Father, for which of them do you stone me? The Jews answered and said, For good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Here the Jews explain why they sought to stone the Lord Jesus Christ. They understood clearly that he was claiming to be one with the Father. In the few verses before where he said, I and the Father are one. They understood clearly that he was not speaking about being one in unity and purpose, but one in nature and one in essence, as the Greek text implies. Thus, you see, the Pharisees recognized that what Jesus was talking about was that he himself was deity in human form. In the Gospel of John, chapter 20 and verse 28, we have the last of the statements in John's Gospel which supports the doctrine that Christ is God as well as man. You remember the story of Doubting Thomas? Well, this story uh, points out that when the resurrected Christ met Doubting Thomas, and demonstrated to him that he had, as a matter of fact, been bodily resurrected from the dead, Thomas answered and said, verse 28, to him. Circle those words in your Bible. In the Greek, the words to him means that the next phrase, the next words, must be applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thomas answered and said, to him, my Lord and my God. Now, of course, some people want to ignore the words to him and say that Thomas was blaspheming. Thomas answered and said, my Lord, my God, you've been raised from the dead. But you see, that's not what Thomas was saying. The text does not say that. The text says, Thomas answered and said to him, the Lord of me, and the God of me. There's no way to escape them. There is no way around the fact that Thomas calls Jesus Christ God in John 20 and verse 28. Who is Jesus Christ according to the Old Testament and the Gospels? He is God manifested in the flesh, the second person of the Trinity. In our next study, we will survey those passages in the rest of the New Testament which speaks of the deity of Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. This has been a Faith Defenders audio presentation. For more information on the Ministry of Faith Defenders, visit faithdefenders.com or call 1-800-41-TRUTH. That's 1-800-41 and the word TRUTH. This is a Faith Defenders audio presentation with author, lecturer, and Christian apologist, Dr. Bob Morin. This morning, we are going to be dealing with the subject of the existence of God. 
Most of you who are hearing the program this morning believe that there really is a God who created the universe in which you live and to whom you are accountable. But there are millions of people today, particularly in communist countries, who would tell you very quickly that the God of Christianity, the God of the Bible, the God of the Lord Jesus Christ is a fraud, that there is no God, there is no ultimate accountability, there is no day of judgment, there are no moral absolutes, there is no one to whom you are accountable above and beyond yourself except the state. The communists are quite active in preaching their doctrine of atheism. They realize that belief in God is the primary enemy of the philosophy of communism or Marxism. If there is a God, then the state is not God. And communism is based upon the idea that an elite group of tyrants in controlling the state would force everyone in that state to give absolute obedience and allegiance to whatever the communist elite would want them to believe. Thus you see the issue with the communists is simply this. Is God God or is the state God? Thus the communists are particularly vicious against the concept of the existence of the Judeo-Christian God. Now there are other kinds of atheists. There are conservative atheists who belong to the Republican Party. There are liberal atheists who belong to the Democratic Party. There are atheists of every stripe and every color and every political spectrum. But they have one thing in common. They are very confident and dogmatic that there is no God. They look at you, those of you who believe in God, and simply shake their head. And they say to themselves, Ah, look at that poor fool over there who believes in God. They don't realize that God is simply the projection of the fears and hopes of people. God is made in man's image. God is simply because people imagine him to be. If everyone died, there would be no God, for the God that exists is only that which exists in the minds of those who wish him to exist. Well, atheism as a species of thought or philosophy is utterly bankrupt. How well did the Bible say in Psalm 14 and verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. In lecturing throughout the United States and colleges and universities, I do try to arrange debates in which I will confront an atheist. This is always a good time for students to see this debate actually unfold before their very eyes. At one well-known uh, a higher education institution in New York City, I was debating an atheist. And I started out by simply saying, the only person who could possibly be an atheist is God. In order to be an atheist, you have to be God. That is, you would have to be that which you affirm does not exist. Now, the reasoning is very simple. In order for someone to make the dogmatic statement there is no God, several things must be true of that person. Number one, that person must know everything. They have to embrace all of knowledge, all of science, all of philosophy, all of theology. They must know anything and everything before they can dogmatically state absolutely that there is no God. But then secondly, they will have to be someone who has been everywhere at the same time within the entire universe and have looked and seen that there is no God. As I said in this debate, what if God lives in Argentina? Have you been to Argentina? And the atheist said, no, we had never been to Argentina. Well, what if God exists there? In order for you to say that there is no God, you would have to be everywhere at the same time and have all knowledge and all understanding in order to be sure that there is 
no God whatsoever. I gave him a piece of chalk and asked him to put a dot on the blackboard, which he did. I said, now that dot represents you. Agreed? And he agreed. Now I want you to draw a circle around that dot. And he did. Inside the circle represents what you know, what you think you know, what you feel you know. You've, what you've read, what you've studied. Uh, for example, uh, if your major was political science, uh, then you have a, a great deal of understanding when it comes to the issue of politics and, and civil law and things of this nature. Inside the circle represents what you know, where you've been, what you've experienced, what you've read. Outside the circle represents what you don't know. For example, I asked him, do you know much about quantum mechanics and higher physics and modern physics? Are you involved in, at all in dealing with the laws of thermodynamics and things of this nature? Well, he said no. Obviously, we are living in an age of specialization where people pick one particular subject and they try to know it well. I said, well, let's look at this diagram. There's the dot, there's the circle. Inside the circle, what you know. Outside the circle, what you don't know. Now, how much do you know in comparison to what you don't know? Well, we talked about it, and he agreed that he had an infinitesimal, uh, tiny amount of knowledge. It would be in the decimal points, point nine 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 nine, or point zero 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 one, or something of that nature. It wouldn't even be one percent. But I said, for the purposes of argumentation, write one percent in the in the inside of the circle, and he did. I said, well, how much is outside the circle? Well, he grumbled, but wrote 99% outside. I said, now, your position is that there is no God. Absolutely, said the professor. Well, give me the chalk. I took the chalk and then drew an X outside the circle in the area which he claimed he did not know. I said, now, you have a right to say that within the world of your personal experience that you've never met God within the area of your own personal knowledge and research, you've never discovered God. But since you admit that 99.999999 or whatever it is, percent of knowledge you don't know, is it possible that God can exist outside of the circle and you just haven't met him yet? Well, the man's face got red and he burst out, this is not fair. I didn't know he was going to do this to me in the debate. I said, well, I'm very sorry if you think it's not fair, but I again will ask you in front of the audience, is it possible that God can exist outside of the circle of your own personal experience? With a deep groan, he admitted that it was possible. Well, I turned to the audience. The debate is now over and theism has now won. For atheism has been demonstrated to be a philosophical absurdity. It is impossible to say that there is no God unless you have been everywhere at the same time and have all knowledge and all power in order to see to it that there is no God in the cosmos. Well, the teacher, the professor, utterly blew up at this and said, well, you haven't disproven my position. Uh, I admit that God may exist. I said, well, then you are no longer an atheist. And he looked stunned. I said, those who say that God may or may not exist, we're talking about agnosticism. We're not talking about atheism, which says that there is no God. Are you now going to publicly move from atheism to agnosticism. Well, with a grumble and a sigh, he rolled his eyes and said, well, I guess, after all, I am only an agnostic and not an atheist. Well, I turned to the student body. The debate is over with, and atheism has been placed in the trash can of the abyss of the unrelated. You see, atheism is a philosophical absurdity. 
It is foolishness. It is stupid. As a matter of fact, as a philosophic concept, atheism does not have a leg to stand on. But I think it's important that we recognize the real reason why people are atheists. The real reason why people cleave to atheism is given by David in Psalm 14. After stating in verse 1 that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, David goes on to describe the immoral and evil lifestyle of these atheists. I have never met an atheist who had not been immoral as a young person. I have never met an atheist whose ethics and morality were superior to those which Christianity has produced through the gospel. The reason that the communists are atheists is so that they can avoid the legal implications of the existence of God. Now, those of you who are out there, you really should listen to me at this point. If there really is a God who is really, really, really there, then you and I are accountable to that God. There is going to be a day of judgment when you are going to stand before your Creator and you must be prepared to meet your God. Now, there are those people who realize that the, there are moral implications to this. If you are accountable to your Creator, then you cannot live the way you want to. So the communists cannot loot and burn and savage and rape and pillage as they do. You see, the communists are simply the barbarians who come to destroy civilization. If they could, they would produce another dark age by coming in with their savagery and with their darkness. The reason that the communists do not want any God is that they do not want any morality. They do not want any ethics. This is why the communists always break every single treaty and promise that they ever make. The reason that SALT II is no good is that the communists broke SALT I. The reason that SALT II is no good is that the communists already broke SALT II before the ink was dry on the paper. The reason that America must arm itself and the free world must take measures to protect itself is that the Soviets do not believe in morality or ethics. As one Russian author said, never trust a man who doesn't believe in God. Well, you see, if you don't believe in God, then you do not believe in moral absolutes. If you do not believe in moral absolutes, then you do not believe in morality. Thus, you can kill. And the communists have slaughtered close to 100 million people have been murdered by the communists since the beginning of the Soviet Revolution. Think about that. One hundred million people slaughtered in the name of atheistic communism. When you want to see what communism does, you need to look at the concentration camps in the Soviet Union or in communist China. If you want to see the final end product of atheistic thinking, then you need to go to Hitler's concentration camps, Auschwitz, Buchenwald, Dachau. There you will find that the atheists had a field day. They took the hair of the people and made bolts of cloth. They took whatever gold was in their teeth. They skinned those men which had tattoos and made pocketbooks and lampshades and shoes and wallets. They took the bones of people and ground them up to make fertilizer. There you have the end product of atheism in which man is dead. You see, the moment you begin by saying that there is no God, then in the second breath you must say that there is no such thing as humanity. All of reality is reduced to inanimate objects, to stones and sticks and stumps. Inanimate simply means non-living. And all of reality is reduced to things, and we can treat people as we please. This is why the communists can never 
generate any view which leads to the dignity and worth of man. This is why the communists cannot even feed themselves. They rely upon the capitalist West in order to give them enough food to eat. Without America, most communist countries would have gone under long time ago. Atheism is the result of a denial of morality. It is the result of rebellion against God, of hatred against God. Atheism is simply one attempt of rebel sinners to flee from the implications of their creatureliness. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11 and verse 6, we read, He who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who will diligently seek him. Here in this famous chapter on faith, the author says, for without faith it is impossible to please God. He who comes to God must believe that he is and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. In order for you to come to a right understanding of yourself, in order for you to have any dignity and worth as a human being, in order for you to have any morals, any ethics whatsoever, you must begin with the God who created the universe. And as you look around you, you can see that God exists. I'll never forget the time in dealing with one atheist that he was plaguing me at that moment with the problem of evil, and he was asking me about the Vietnam War and how could there be a God and allow war to exist. When I turned to him and said, John, you know deep down that there is a God and you know that you are a sinner and you rebel against this God and you don't want this God because you don't want to live as this God wants you to live. But you know deep down that these things are true. There was a look of shock on his face. After claiming to be an atheist for all these years, the mask was torn away and he stood there. He looked down to the floor and mumbled, yes, I know there's a God, and yes, I know I don't want him. This, in the last analysis, is the real root of atheism. It is rebellion against God because of the desire to live an evil lifestyle. How well the scriptures point out that there is a God. There is a God to whom we are accountable. There is a God who will require of us an assessment of our lives on the day of judgment. There is a God, ladies and gentlemen, and you're going to stand before him on that great day. And there's only one way to escape from an eternal hell, and that is if you have accepted his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Jesus said, He who sees me has seen the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. The only antidote to the poison of atheism is biblical Christianity, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look to Jesus, look to the gospel, for in these things we find reality and we find the world as it really is. We want to deal with the subject of agnosticism. In our last talk together, we demonstrated that atheism is a philosophic impossibility. The only person who can be an atheist is God. For in order to dogmatically state that there is no God, one would have to be everywhere at the same time 
in the entire universe and know all things. Thus, atheism is an impossibility. Well, when atheism is shown to be foolishness, there are many people who try to hide behind the badge of agnosticism. What is an agnostic? Well, the word agnostic comes from two Greek words, the alpha prefix, or a, and the Greek word gnosis. It simply means not knowing or ignorant. Someone who is an agnostic is someone who is admitting that they are ignorant. Now, first off, I think this is amazing, particularly given the times that I have debated agnostics on a college platform or in a university setting. The agnostic is very dogmatic. The agnostic is shouting and carrying on and making statements and giving assertions. In one breath, they say they are agnostics, which means they are admitting that they are ignorant. And in the other breath, they are dogmatically stating things as if they knew and we're not agnostics. I think the first thing that needs to be pointed out is that there are two different kinds of agnostics. There are ordinary agnostics and there are ornery agnostics. An ordinary agnostics is simply that honest soul who says, gee, I don't know if there's a God or not. If you can show me enough evidence from my own personal experience that points to, to the existence of God, I'll believe in him. I have nothing against God. I'll believe in God if you can demonstrate to me that there is more evidence for him than there is against him. But the second kind of agnostic is the ornery agnostic. This is the guy with the bulging veins in his forehead and bulging eyes and red neck, looks at you and says, I don't know if there's a God. You don't know if there's a God. No one knows if there's a God. This is the dogmatic, brash, pompous fool who claims that no one can know whether or not there is a God. And, of course, he is refuting himself. Those people who say there is no knowledge that is possible has just given you a piece of knowledge that they want you to accept. Or those who say we can know uh, nothing uh, for sure or certainly want you to be very certain about that piece of information. Well, we're not going to waste our time with the ornery agnostic. The man is a buffoon. The man is a fool who has an immoral lifestyle that he wants to engage in and he's afraid of the evidence that would lead him to the existence of God. But let us point instead to the person who claims to be an ordinary agnostic, someone who says, if you can show me from my own experience that there is a God, then I will believe it. Now, in, sp in speaking to such a person, the first step is to ask them whether or not they believe that the universe exists. For you, to begin with, we only have one of two op uh, options. One, the universe as we experience it exists. It is really there. So there is really a radio from which you are listening to this program. There is really a table on which the radio sits. There is really a floor on which the table on which the radio sits, and so on. The world as we know it really exists. Or those who like to follow Hinduism and Buddhism and various of the mind cults of today, they would state that reality, the world as we know it, only exists in the mind. And they would tell you that what uh, you see is an illusion that things do not really exist. They are only projections of the mind. And I think it's helpful to begin by pointing out that we need to have the axiom of existence.